Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So nice to be here and see all your lovely smiling faces. I hope you've had a lovely day so far. In August to September in 1977, NASA launched its Voyager mission in which it sent its twin spacecraft, Voyager 1 and 2, on a mission to explore the giant planets of Jupiter and Saturn. After Voyager 1 and 2 had completed their mission, the mission was extended. Voyager 2 went on to explore some of the outer planets in our solar system, and Voyager 1 went on to study the outer solar system. On Valentine's Day 1990, Voyager 1 had travelled 6.4 billion kilometres away from its home planet of Earth and it was entering the fringes of the solar system. It was at this time that scientist Carl Sagan, who was also a consultant and advisor to NASA, suggested that engineers turn Voyager 1 around, take one last look at planet Earth, and take a photo that would become one of the greatest scientific photos of all time. It was named Pale Blue Dot. I don't know if any of you can see it, but up in sort of the middle area to the top, there's this tiny speck. I'll just circle it for you. This is our Earth. It just appears as the slightest speck in sort of a half a pixel in the picture. Later, Carl Sagan wrote in his book entitled Pale Blue Dot. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's us. That's home. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species live there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. He goes on to say later in this chapter, the earth is the only world known so far to harbour life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. All this begs the question, why are we here? What is our purpose here on Earth? Does this world, this pale blue dot, have any significance in the vast universe? Or are we just simply an accident, waiting to fall into everlasting oblivion? Tonight, we are going to find out if life really does have a purpose. Where did we come from and where are we going? Many people throughout history have questioned their purpose on Earth. For instance, Sophocles said 2,400 years ago, to never have been born may be the greatest boon or blessing or benefit of all. I cried when I was born and every day shows why, wrote poet George Herbert. Pedro Calderon de la Barca said, it is man's greatest crime to have been born. 
What a sad view of life to have. But yet to many, life is meaningless and without hope. We hustle, we struggle in life, we go all this way and then after that we die. It can seem too hard to make sense of it all. No wonder we wrestle with questions that cry out for answers that sometimes don't even seem to come. Why do we exist? What is our purpose here on earth? What are our origins? Where did we come from? Are we really just an accident? What can we hope for? Is there anything more to life than what we see in the here and now? What is this we have found ourselves in, in this world? Is there really a battle going on between good and evil with this earth as its centre? Where are we heading? Is there any hope for the future? Why so much pain and suffering in our world today? And what can it all mean when death seems to have the final say anyway? Is death really the end? The wise King Solomon, one of the Bible writers, agrees. He says in Ecclesiastes 2.11, then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labour in which I had toiled. And indeed, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. King Solomon had everything in this world that the world could offer. Brilliance, fame, money, women, power, glory and more. He had accomplished more in his one life than a normal person would in five years. He was one of the most successful people on the face of the earth to exist. But yet, I'm sorry, but yet at the end of his days, he deemed it all meaningless and a chasing after the wind. King Solomon had everything, but was he completely satisfied? No. Even in the age of intelligence, in this age of technology and progress, we can still miss the reason why we're here on earth, our purpose why we're here. Let me illustrate. Imagine that a box of medicines washes up on the shore of a pre-civilization island where people live that have had no contact with the outside world. The curious people open up the box and find all kind of strange little cylinders with long sharp points, bottles filled with pills and strange liquids. Now, they might shape the pill bottles in order to make music. They might use the liquid medicine as makeup. They might even find the syringes useful for squirting seawater at each other for the fun of it. <laughs> the point is, without knowing the purpose of the medicines, without knowing the origins, what they were meant for, the people couldn't really, they couldn't at all get the real benefits out of the medicines. How much more so with our lives today? If we don't know what our purpose is, what we were made for and what our origins are, won't we miss out on so much? Life is meaningless, just like we heard Sophocles and Carl Sagan and all those guys say, life is meaningless until and unless you understand what your purpose is. Life is meaningless unless you understand what your purpose is. That's why people from the beginning of time have always tried to explain their origins. The ancients, for instance, had many creation stories. The ancient Babylonian creation story, Enuma Illus, tells about two battling gods in which the defeated god's body is cut into half to create the heavens and half to create the earth. 
The 20th century scientist Francis Crick believed that space aliens from another planet came and seeded life on Earth, and that's how we got here. And indigenous Australian culture sees their origins in the Dreamtime stories. For most of human history, humans have believed that we in one way or another came from God or gods. But today, many from developed countries believe that we evolved from lower life forms instead. This is how the theory of evolution attempts to explain that we got here. But this afternoon, I want to take a look at a different picture of how it all started. And it starts right at the beginning of the Bible. In Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth. For centuries, students of the Bible have commented on this matter-of-fact way of beginning the Bible. There are no involved and intricate attempts at logic to prove that God exists. There's no proofs offered that he created the heavens and the earth. It's just stated as a fact, period. We exist, the Bible teaches, because God took the initiative. What a stark contrast between evolution in which we exist purely by chance and the Bible account which teaches that we were not only purposefully created by God but created in his image as well. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Yet even if we believe that God is God, that he is our creator, that we existed because of him, there's still many questions that remain. One of the biggest is, how do we make sense of our own lives, our own place in this world, especially with all the pain and suffering that's so part of our lives today? We all struggle in a world that's gone completely crazy. We see it in the news, we see it everywhere. It just seems to be turned upside down. But it's actually precisely the kind of world that God has predicted that we'd be living in. Did you know that the Bible has warned us that our world would be as we see it today? In fact, God has given us signs, warnings even, about what to expect. So what are some of these signs, these signs of the times, and what are we to make of them? Wars and rumours of wars. For decades leading up to the 20th century, people really believed that the world was going to get better. And that as technology, as intelligence and knowledge increased, that people were going to get better as well. Many thought that as we came in to the 20th century, that war would cease and we would come into a world filled with peace. But in contrast, almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus himself told us about the end times in which we live. He said, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Who was right? What does our world look like today? The optimism of the earliest 20th century or the picture that Jesus painted of our world? Within the second decade of the 20th century, World War I had started. It was soon followed by World War II, and from then until now, there has been ceaseless wars, many going on right now. What are some more of the signs that we can expect? About 2,600 years ago, the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament wrote about our times. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. 
While it's true that there is generally a vast increase in knowledge, this prediction relates to the increase of knowledge in the prophecies of Daniel, prophecies that were shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Because of our world's vast increase in science and technology, communication has also increased, which allows these prophecies to be able to be spread over the entire world. In seconds, we can communicate to almost any point in the world, something that was unheard of even 150 years ago. All of this becomes important in light of these words spoken by Jesus. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Again, we can see that Jesus' prophecy has been fulfilled. The idea of spreading the gospel to the entire world in a day and age of instant communication is so much more likely now than in when Jesus first spoke it 2,000 years ago. In Luke 21, Jesus is telling his disciples about some of the signs that will happen just before the time of the end. He says in Luke 21, 11, and there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. A new study finds that there were more than twice as many large earthquakes in the first quarter of 2014 as compared with the average since 1979. And between 1900 and 2014, the average yearly rate of earthquakes of magnitude 8 and larger was 0.65. In the past 10 years, that rate jumped by almost three times to 1.8. It's interesting. On May 22, 1960, the city of Valdivia, Chile, was shaken with the highest magnitude earthquake recorded in human history. It measured a whopping 9.5 on the moment magnetite scale. It is uncertain how many deaths it caused and how many people were injured, but they number in the thousands. It also displaced two million people and the tsunami that resulted caused deaths and destruction as far away as Hawaii, Japan, and even the Philippines. Exactly 259 years ago today, the Great Lisbon Earthquake rocked the world. It made an impact that would never be forgotten. The quake lasted for an incredible 10 minutes and shaking was felt all throughout Europe, all throughout Portugal, sorry, and into Spain, parts of North Africa, France, Switzerland, and even in Northern Italy. Following the quake, a devastating fire destroyed a large part of Lisbon and a tsunami caused destruction along the coasts of Portugal, southwest Spain, and western Morocco. The people of Portugal still remember those who were lost in the great Lisbon earthquake. You can see flowers decorated along the streets of Lisbon here. It caused an impact that shook the world, literally. What are some other signs that we can expect that Jesus talked about? Famines and pestilences. Today, many millions, sorry, live under the threat of famine, pestilence, hunger, and starvation. Unimaginable numbers have died in the past century from famine and pestilence. According to the Food and Agricultural Org Organization of the United Nations, about 805 million people, or one in nine of the world's population, are chronically undernourished, 
with insufficient food for an active and healthy life. According to the World Food Programme, hunger kills more people every year than AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis combined. And poor nutrition causes nearly half, or 45%, of deaths in children under five. That's 3.1 million children each year. And what about pestilences? From 1918 to 1920, the Spanish influenza alone killed an estimated 50 million people. And something that we're all aware of at the moment, the 2014 West African Ebola outbreak has currently claimed almost 5,000 lives. All of this and more we see daily in our lounge rooms through the news, through mass media, even as we walk down the street. What do these signs mean? What can we take from them? How can they help us understand the story of our world and our place in it? Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest creative minds in history, was not only noted for his talent as a painter and sculptor, but also for his talent as an architect and an inventor. He invented the bicycle, aeroplane, helicopter and parachute 500 years before their time. His notebooks were filled with drawings and writing on a most diverse range of topics such as geology, anatomy, flight, gravity and even optics. As well as the inventions mentioned before, Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks were also full of scores of other inventions such as machine guns, submarines and diving bells. When he died, Leonardo left behind nearly 7,000 pages of drawings with instructions about how to construct inventions of all kinds. The only problem was that no one could read these instructions because it appeared to be done in a type of code. It was then found out that Leonardo had written his instructions in left-handed mirror script, so it was all backwards. When you held them up to a mirror, by holding them up to a mirror, the message then became perfectly clear. God's plan for planet Earth may sometimes seem as confusing as one of Leonardo da Vinci's writing pages. <laughs> Life seems a puzzle, and it can seem like it makes absolutely no sense. But despite all the questions and all the suffering, the Bible gives us reasons not to despair. If you try holding up life with all its puzzles to the mirror of God's word, the Bible, you'll be surprised, just like I was and still am, at how much clearer things are. I've been in my life places where it's the lowest of the low, it feels like. And the only thing that has brought me through is the Word of God. It offers hope and it encourages trust. It looks beyond at what we see today and points us to a better and brighter future, one that we could never, ever imagine. The Bible says... For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Another promise in the word. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. These are just two of the many wonderful promises about what the ultimate future holds, a future offered to all who will accept it. Even, there, even though there is so much pain and suffering in our world today, God has given us hope for the future. He has also created so many beautiful things for us to enjoy 
and to show us how much he loves us. We see beauty in the heavens, the magnificent nebulae and galaxies, such as the butterfly nebula, the cone nebula, the whirlpool galaxy, the Carina nebula, the planetary nebula, the Orion Nebula and the Crab Nebula. Isn't it amazing? They're all amazing things that God has made for us to show us how mighty he is and how mighty must he be to be able to create that. It blows my mind. But not only has God created beauty in the heavens, he's created beauty on earth for us to enjoy such as the majestic Angel Falls in Venezuela. Even wildflowers along a forest path. And even the very simplest things of life, which seem simple to us, but are actually wonderful, like a beautiful, soft, cuddly bunny. All of these things were created for us to enjoy, but these are just a taste of what we can look forward to in the future. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.9, But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Even though we have all this beauty around us, we can't even imagine how great the things that God has prepared for us and has for us will be. This afternoon we have discovered that there is hope out there. It's a hope that I have found and it keeps me strong every day. If you would like to find out more about this hope, stay around. This series will help you discover a hope for your future and it's better than you could ever Imagine.